I'll just say something very short in Swedish, excuse me, Timothy. Please, please. Well, amerikansk historiker, specialiserad på Ryssland och Ukraina och andra världskriget. Eh, med flera intressanta böcker bakom sig. En, eh, han är professor vid Yale University, that's right. Och eh, hans bok som in English is called Bloodlands. Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin has been translated uh, into over 20 languages, is that correct? Mm. It's a fantastic book. Last, I, last time I tried to buy it, it was um, sold out, but hopefully it's in the stores now. And um, now you've written this. I have the English or American version. I bought it as soon as I saw it, and this is the Swedish translation, and Timothy will be signing it after this talk uh, outside. All right, so we'll just uh, dive in. Uh, this, uh, there's, need a watch. I was thinking, I wanted to start with two thoughts that I believe we share. I could be wrong. Uh, but they are in themselves, they contradict themselves, contradict each other. The one is that history never repeats itself, but as you write in this book, it can be instructive. So that's one point of view that I think we share. And the other one is that there are things like, oh yes, please turn off your cell phones and all that. Thank you. Uh, and the other thought is that things have happened in history, like, for instance, genocide. So, therefore, we know they can happen again. So how do you see on these two thoughts? Uh, are they, do they contradict each other? They don't contradict each other at all. Uh, of course, history doesn't repeat itself. There's an American writer whom you probably know called Mark Twain who, who would say that history rhymes, which is a nice phrase, but it doesn't even really rhyme. It, what, what history does is it casts a line backward so that we can see people who are in situations similar enough to our own that we might learn from them. If you think about it, the demand that history repeat itself is an impossible demand. It's not even true in the present. I, I can learn from you and you can learn from me. We can learn from each other, even though none of our experiences is exactly the same, right? Your life doesn't repeat my life, but I can still learn from your life. So history is like that. It's a vast reservoir of life. It, the fact that it's life in a different period means that we can sometimes notice things that we wouldn't notice about ourselves, even though they are true. And that's, that's the premise of on tyranny. The premise of on tyranny is that Europeans in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s we're not so different from ourselves. The premise is that we're, we likely think that we have learned, but perhaps we haven't, perhaps we should check again. And the way that we check in the book is that we return to people like Viktor Klemper or Hannah Arendt or Václav Havel who lived through fascism or national socialism or communism and, and we, we see whether we've actually learned the lessons. And you know, now is a good time, now is a good time to, to check those things. But I find that uh, it's almost um, a, a habit or a, a way of not really thinking to just yeah. uh, say that we're in the 30s again and that history repeats themselves itself. It's, it's, I don't, I, th I know you do believe that we, there are some, a lot of similarities to the 30s today, especially in the US. Uh, but I'm, 
I wouldn't be interested to hear about that because I myself think it's a dangerous analogy to uh, to to do. Well, so I'll, let me start from America. In in the United because it's always more comfortable to make fun of your own country or at least more polite. Um, in the United States, the way we think about history is that we say it's not exactly like Nazi Germany, and therefore history doesn't matter. So the whole move is to say from the beginning that history doesn't matter. So in a paradoxical fashion, our very acknowledgement of the Holocaust immediately makes the Holocaust irrelevant because what we say is, this is not exactly like that, therefore we have nothing to learn, and therefore we move back to our very comfortable American position that everything is new all the time, there's nothing to be learned from the past, right? So for me, like at least in my immediate intellectual environment, that's the present danger, that we, that we, we only, I mean, in the United States, only two things ever happened, the Civil War and the Holocaust. I mean, I'm exaggerating somewhat, but that's basically it. We have the Civil War and we have the Holocaust. And now we have charming neo-Nazis who bring the two things together in one place. Um, so the, so, so my, the danger in the US is, is that people use, ironically, they use the Holocaust to dismiss history by saying, since it was unique, it's as though it never happened, right? This is the, that, since it, since it, since it, since this is not like that, we can forget about that. Now, my move is not to say that we are living again in the 1930s. My move is to say that looking at the 1930s can help us see a few things that we might not otherwise notice. Most broadly, the danger of the failure of globalization. So, when at least in English, when we say globalization, we are almost by definition talking about something that's happened for the first time. Right? Globalization brings with it an aura of connotations of novelty, of unprecedentedness. But in fact, there was another globalization. There was the globalization of the 1880s, 1890s, 1900s. And that globalization had the same rhetoric as ours, the rhetoric of optimism, the rhetoric which says, um, the right wing has no future, the future is going to be <clears throat> liberal or socialist, Enlightenment is going to spread along with export-led growth, and we're all going to be happy. That's what people thought as late as summer of 1914. So history can help us to see that globalization can fail. It can also help us to see that the stories about progress have come with a certain danger, right? That if you get yourself stuck in, in thinking that there are no alternatives, Remember how people used to say that, at least in my country, we said that all the time. There are no alternatives. Once you think there are no alternatives, then you lose sight of the alternatives that are actually emerging. And then there are the practical lessons. You don't have to be in Nazi Germany to recognize that people in 1933 made some mistakes and that you should avoid those mistakes. Your leader doesn't have to be Hitler in order for you to do things that will make right-wing authoritarianism or whatever it is less likely. So, so let me give you an example. One of the things that people did in 1933 in Germany was that they gave the new government their passive consent. They normalized it very quickly, right? That is a relevant lesson all the time. Even if the new government is not as bad as Hitler, you still shouldn't normalize it. You still should recognize that the things that you do or don't do in the beginning matter a lot. So uh, I'm not, I agree with you that it's not the same thing, but I think, I, I'm not sure from what else we can learn exactly. And there's one more point that I would make that makes these comparisons inevitable. And that is that everybody, I mean, not you and I, but there is a huge swath of the political spectrum in both Europe and the United States which is very consciously looping back to the 1930s and saying that the 1930s were a wonderful time. And when that's true, it's hard to ignore the 1930s. So it's, it's explicit in Russia, it's explicit in the United States, where our, 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 our presidential slogan is America first. America first is literally Deutschland über alles in English. America first meant 
Um, oh, as soon as I say something in German, then there's a hush, okay. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna use more German, it seems to be very effective. Um, uh, America First was a movement in the United States in the late 1930s until 1941, which said that Americans and Nazis have more in common than we have separating us. America First meant um, um, the idea, Charles Lindbergh's idea, was that the United States, France, and Germany, Britain should get together and protect themselves from the hordes of black and brown people who are, in, who are the real danger, right? So th that's looping back to the 1930s. It's a conscious reference to the 1930s. So when, and, and this is, it's very striking. I mean, in, in, even in Europe, Hungary, Poland, Russia, but implicitly the Brexit movement and Front National are referring to an imagined 1930s, some period when there was a nation state. That period never happened. You, you know, these countries were never nation states, they were empires. But there's a reference to an imagined 1930s. There's this weird looping back. And given that that's true, I, I, I can't help but think at least one thing that historians should do is say that the 1930s weren't such a good time. I agree, it wasn't. <laughs> uh, now, what I'm thinking is that the last two years, this has been a more and more common reference in the public debate and also in private conversations. And what is, it has led to, I think, is a kind of spreading sense of depression and, uh, and a, f a feeling of helplessness that we're doomed somehow to repeat the 30s. And I think that's how we receive the, for instance, the Nazis marching on, on Swedish streets. It's like an echo of something we're very afraid of. And that makes us some kind of, in a collective depression. This is my interpretation, and I can be wrong, but that's why I think it's dangerous. It, there is a danger in, in referring too much to a period in time where a lot of things were so different as well. It was a much more authoritarian um, is the word I want to say. Authoritarian. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, society. Well, okay, so, so I'm, going to, I'm going to question the premise, but mm -hmm. then I'm going to make a point about what on tyranny is actually about. So I, there are ways in which the 1930s were more authoritarian than our own times. But there are ways in which our own times are more authoritarian than the 1930s as well. I'm, I would be very skeptical about assuming that populations now, especially young people, are more democratic than populations in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. That's actually not clear from the statistical data at all. Moreover, there were things that people in the 1930s were better at than we were. They were better at reading books, for example. A lot of the things that we associate with liberalism or with democracy, like long attention spans, for example. Germans in the 1930s had longer attention spans than Americans in 2017, 2017 unquestionably. They also had better newspapers up, up, until, you know, up until the Gleichschaltung. They had better newspapers. So I, I, I don't, it's not clear to me that we can look at, I'm just gonna talk about America, I'll leave Sweden to you, but it's not clear to me that we can really look at our own societies and say, oh yes, this is a natural, a natural spring of, of democracy. But the point of on tyranny is something else entirely. In on tyranny, I don't dwell on the 1930s and how it's just like the 1930s. In on tyranny, in this book, I take examples from the 1930s. I also take examples from communism in the 1940s. I take examples from late communism in the 1970s. And I take examples from postmodern authoritarianism in the 2000s, because my point is not that we're looping back to something. I agree with you that that's a danger. My point is that history is there to teach us. History is there to give us the ability to recognize patterns and also the ability to borrow tactics from people who have been through similar things before. So I agree with you about the danger. I mean, in a way, this is what the whole book is about, um, that we, you think everything's going great, and then something happens, and you flip immediately over to everything's going badly, right? I don't, I'm not gonna blame the 1930s for that. I'm gonna blame us for that. It's our problem if we believe in stories of progress and then switch over to stories of doom. The point of the book 
is that you use history to establish your own agency. You recognize from history what the patterns are, and once you see the patterns, you also see the possibilities for action. So On Tyranny is a political pamphlet which is entirely about what you should be doing. It's the last thing, it's the furthest thing away from saying the 1930s were bad, therefore let's all be depressed. In fact, I mean, it's about not being depressed because people are depressed. I'm just looking at you to see how depressed you look. Oh, they're, they're very depressed. No, yeah, they actually yeah. look pretty yeah. good compared <laughs> to some other audiences that I see. Um, but, but you get depressed when you don't do anything, right? One of the traps of authoritarian regime change is that you feel overwhelmed with bad news and you say, what can I do? And then suddenly our whole idea of citizenship just vanishes um, into this pit. And, and so the book is also, it's a kind of political hygiene or political therapy where it gives you things that you can do regularly which aren't that difficult, but when you do them, you end up feeling a lot better. And that's not, I mean, this business of depression is very important because, it, because it's not, it's not just psychological, it's political. One of the ways that democracies collapse is when people decide, I can't do anything about them, right? Exactly. Uh, and that's why I wrote about this book in a very early stage. It has just been published in, in English. And I called it a moral manual for Democrats uh, because it, it, it delivers what you wanted it to do. And, um, but you wrote it as a direct uh, reaction on Trump's uh, presidency and, well, campaign as well. And why would you say Trump is a tyrant? Well, so it's interesting what you just said, that I wrote it as a, re a reaction to his presidency. Because, of course, I didn't, right? I wrote it as a re reaction to the campaign, um, the 20 lessons I wrote in November. In fact, I wrote them on a, on a, on a, on a uh, Scandinavian air flight out of Copenhagen. That's when I started after leaving Stockholm. I was in Stockholm when Trump won. Um, so in some sense, it all began here. But I, I wrote them, and then these lessons people continue to find relevant almost a year into the presidency. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is that his actions do unfortunately resemble some of the worst <laughs> lessons or some of the worst patterns that we see in right-wing authoritarianism especially, but not only in, in the 20th century. Um, and I'm just, I'm just saying that because I, it's been very striking for me. The career of this book has been very striking. I wrote it with no knowledge of what he would do as president because he wasn't president yet. I wrote it only on the basis of intuition coming from me being a historian and coming from his behavior as a candidate. So unfortunately, his behavior as president is, is essentially the same as his behavior as a candidate. The, fir the first and most obvious thing is his attitude towards the truth. So mo modern tyrants have to do away with truth. If you're a fascist, you have to say, the apparent facts are not important. What matters is the deep unity of the people. If you're a communist, you have to say, the facts of today, whether they seem to or not, are all pointing in one direction towards a certain future. And the facts that don't seem to be pointing that way are the ones we can disregard, or we can suppress the people who generate those facts. Um, a classic example of that would be the execution of the people who carried out the Soviet census in 1937 because that census showed that there had been massive political famine in Ukraine. If you're a postmodern authoritarian like Mr. Putin or like Mr. Trump, um, you don't have a vision of the future necessarily, but you have the need to do away with factuality. And so you fill up the public sphere with lies. And this is not an accident or just a personality quirk. It's, it's a form of politics because your idea is not just to convince people or tell them what they want to hear. Your idea is to be so absurd and, and grotesque that you call into question all authority, right? So you call into question, you call authority into question by being an authority who lies all the time. That's a form of politics. And then you, when, there, when there are actual authorities who do tell the truth, or try to, like investigative reporters, 
your second move is to say, they're the liars. They're the ones who carry out the fake news. And you do this with consistency. Again, this is true in both Russia and America. So Mr. Trump consistently refers to our reporters, our journalists, as the purveyors of fake news, or he said this twice now, as the enemies of the people, right? Nice phrase, enemies of the people. So, um, so you, 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 you cast doubt on all authorities by being one who lies, and then by using violent language against the people who are the source of truth. And the idea is just to create total confusion or total doubt, where people are just left with their own emotions and inclinations, and with this idea that if it feels good, it's true. If it feels good, it's true. People stop distinguishing between what they want to believe and what's actually true. And that makes it much easier for someone like Mr. Putin or someone like Mr. Trump to, to govern. So that's the main thing. I mean, the, a, a, sec, a second thing would be the very casual way, I mean, the painfully casual way that he uses language of insider and outsider. That, you know, using, so if I, to refer to Carl Schmidt, um, Mr. Trump does not cite Carl Schmidt, but I will. Um, the, the idea of politics is beginning from the definition of the enemy and the friend, right? Um, that's the classic Nazi definition of politics. So rather than the, the, the state doing something for its citizens, the state is defined by who the enemy is. And Mr. Trump in his own banal and sometimes comical, but always I'm afraid very damaging way, does this all the time. He re when he refers to Mexican immigrants as rapists, um, when he refers to African-American athletes as sons of bitches, when he, when he uses this kind of vulgar language, he is making the community of us, not all the citizens or not everyone present, he's making the community of us just the white people or just the white people who voted for him. Or as Mr. Trump once put it in an unguarded moment, the real people, right? So, so now I'm stuck on German. This is what das Volk meant. If he, when, when Hitler said das Volk, he didn't mean the whole people. He meant the people who are, who are with us. And then, you know, so it's interesting to the point of pain that Mr. Trump's spokesman, I'm just gonna cite this as one example of a million, Mr. Trump's press spokesman, Sean Spicer, when he was talking about the Holocaust, said, well, Hitler didn't kill his own people, right? Now think about that for a moment, right? There's something fundamentally, I mean, it's not just an error of fact. There's something fundamentally, ethically wrong here because what he's saying is that the Jews, the German Jews were not Hitler's own people. He's accepting, they're accepting that notion of what the people are, that, that, what das Volk was. So, so there's that, there's that, and then there's the lawlessness. So, I mean, there's the fact that there, there's the way that Mr. Trump is constantly pushing up against the system to try to find a weak spot, um, to, to find a way around the law. And it's, that's where the American contest is being played out now. It's not the normal checks and balances. Congress is not checking Mr. Trump in any meaningful way. We're currently having discussion in the United States about whether the Congress should pass a law to require the president to check with them before he starts a nuclear war, which would be funny if it weren't necessary, right? Um, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's tragicomic because on the one hand, even Republicans realize that the man could start a nuclear war for no reason. At the same time, they don't have the courage to say so <laughs> or to pass appropriate legislation. Uh, anyway, I should let it go there. No, it's just a problem for me because every th sentence you say, I get in three questions uh, in my head. But I'll we'll we'll try to take a one ask, at a time. Ask one of those three questions. <laughs> yeah. No, but I was thinking you wrote, you wrote the book uh, during the campaign. And then since then, I've seen talks and I've also read about talks where you uh, talk about it, that it takes, you, you have this thes uh, thesis that it takes a year and only one year to uh, de deconstruct uh, the, the state or the democra demo democra sorry, I'm sorry, democratic system. Uh, and now looking back, what do you see? Because the American institutions have actually showed that uh, 
they put up resistance. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're not that easily. So it goes back to our discussion about what history is and my point that history is what we make within the limitations of what we find. Um, I realize I'm paraphrasing Marx there. Like we, 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 make, we make history, but we make it in the world that we find. So when I say that we had a year, I didn't mean let's set our clocks and wait a year and see what happens. I meant people, we have a year to do things. That was my point. And I mean, obviously not just because of me, but a lot of Americans have done a lot of things. Most meaningfully, the investigative reporters, that's a, the, 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 the 2000 or so people who still are paid investigative reporters in the United States have done a huge amount. Without them, we would know basically nothing. And they have been a real problem for him. That they're one reason that he, you know, there's a reason why he calls them enemies of the people, which is that if, if it weren't for the Guardian, the Washington Post, the New York Times, BuzzFeed, um, a few other places who actually report on Mr. Trump, he would have a much easier time. Um, the marches have been very meaningful because if you're going to claim to speak for the people, it's bad for you when very large numbers of people come out against you all the time. Um, it's it, the, the, the lawyers, I mean, not like maybe not a group that everyone celebrates, but for me, a very special group because in, in, in the 1930s, which I admit is my, you know, my obsession, in the 1930s, the German lawyers enabled, very actively enabled the regime change, both by coming up with a new spirit of the law, but also by actively serving in the SS, for example, where, as you might know, most of the commanders of the Einsatzgruppen had degrees in law, precisely. So, but a, a number of American lawyers have done very clever and interesting things to try to get in the way of Trump, which matters because it slows things down. And if you want to have a regime change, you need, you need time. So, and then in addition to that, there are dozens of other small organizations. So we had a year to do things and we've done something is the short answer. Not as much as I would have liked, but we've done something. Nevertheless, the country has changed a lot in the last, in the last year. And it's hard, and it, with the exception of the fact that millions of citizens are now active in ways they weren't before, if you just look at the system, I mean, I, I guess it's very hard to think of a way in which the system has not gotten worse, right? It's very, like if you just look at the government, no matter whether your perspective is right wing or left wing or liberal or whatever, it's very hard to name a way in which the government is actually better than it was a year before. In most respects, we're, we're, we're doing worse. But, so maybe I misunderstood you when, when I, because I understood it as you, you talked about, it took one year, if one wanted to, it wouldn't be longer than that to, to yeah. deconstruct yeah. the democratic system. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, that's, that's no, no, see that, I mean, I say that because that's, that's how long it took in 1933, mm. but also that's how, so if you look at contemporary cases like Poland or Hungary, it takes about two years to, so the, 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 the Polish government now is on the brink of doing away with the rule of law, which is one of these steps from which it's very hard to go back. The, the Hungarian government took about two years using perfectly legal mechanisms to do away with, in effect, the rule of law in their own country. So. There is a kind. There is there is a clock, and my point was you have to start at the beginning, right? You have to you have to know how to act, and then and then once people do act, then you know then the calculation of course changes. What I meant was if you just let it go, a year from now your action won't be important. Or just like I, I did a lot of this with I don't know if like if it works in Sweden, but in Americans people in America people really like it if you talk with your fingers. So I said that you know in normal democratic situation your influence is like this. And then when the regime starts to change, for the first year or so, your influence is actually much, much greater because so much more is at stake, because the whole rules of the political game are now at stake. But then your influence drops way down after the system changes. And so the point is you have to act on this, when this is the curve, you have to act here, because if you don't, then you end up here. If you do act here, then maybe this collapse never, never happens. That's the idea. So, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of where to go. I, I, I'm, I mean, there's one 
one way of talking about the globalization. I'd like to go there as well, uh, but I think we'll, I'll stick with the things I've, I know you've been talking about earlier. You should really feel free to ask whatever you I, want. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking aloud. Uh, because you talk about, we, I mean, you talk, we talk a lot about Trump. We think about Trump. We're worrying about Trump. But do you actually uh, think the major threat, if I am right, is Putin? You, that the, you say that the, the uh, development right now, there's a direction from the east towards the west. They, it used to be the other way around but now it's the Putin way of ruling that is actually influencing the US and the rest of the world. Well, let me start with the superficial answer and then try to move to the more profound answer. The superficial answer is that the United States was clearly very much influenced by Russian foreign policy in 2016. The Republican candidate for president of the United States was a failed businessman, a failed real estate developer, whose personal fortune was only rescued by very unusual deals with Russian entities, which basically involved their giving him lots of money to do nothing, right? Um, which is suspect in the business world in general. I mean, I'm not a business person, but I take it that that's unusual, that someone just gi gives you tens of millions of dollars in exchange for which you do nothing. And then they build a building. And then in the building that they build, they put your name on the front and then they use it to launder money. Again, like I'm not an expert, but I think this is a little bit dodgy. That is, that is how Mr. Trump survived. Um, Russian investors gave him money, gave him money to build buildings in which he played no role. He literally had no investment. He had no financial stake but he got a payment in advance, and then he got a percentage of the owner of the, of the earnings. And then those buildings, uh, Russians would buy units and then sell them. Or in the case of Trump Tower, which was built earlier, an entire floor of Trump Tower, the 51st floor, was used for a money laundering operation, a Russian money laundering, an entire floor. I mean, it's possible that Mr. Trump didn't know about it, I guess. Um, he lived right above it, by the way. Um, it's possible he didn't know about it. So, so basically, we're, we're looking at someone who only exists in America because of Russian money. That's the first part. The second part is it's very clear that the Russian elite very early was banking on him as, the, as their candidate. I wrote about this in spring of 2016. I think I was the first person to write about it. If you look at the Russian sources, it was very clear that in the Russian parliament, um, in the Russian media, there was, there was a lot of support for Mr. Trump. Um, the, the, the chairman of the Commission for Foreign Affairs in the Russian parliament said, we like him because he's going to drive the Western locomotive right off the rails, which is a very vivid expression and I think perfectly accurate. But, and then in addition to that, you have the fact that Mr. Trump ran a very Russian campaign. His campaign, um, was, his campaign manager was Paul Manafort, who is someone who, uh, first of all, is in debt, or at least was, maybe he's not anymore, to a major Russian oligarch who's close to Mr. Putin. And Mr. Manafort was last seen as the advisor to Viktor Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine, who was chased out of his country trying, well, while trying to Russify it, basically. So, and then, you know, when, when democratic operatives looked at Mr. Trump's presidential campaign, they said, this is very weird because we can't see the campaign. Where is the campaign? There doesn't seem to be a campaign here. And the reason why they couldn't see it is that it was being run in a very unconventional way. For one thing, um, uh, the, the, the Russians were paying for a lot of campaign advertisement, which, you know, we in our naivete, it didn't even occur to us that this was happening. And only now, a year later, it's coming out just how much of this there was just how many millions or tens of millions of people were reached by Russian campaign advertising in, in, our, in our election. Oh, it was all for Mr. Trump, by the way, in case you were wondering. Um, or more interestingly, it wasn't for Mr. Trump, but it was about demotivating people from voting, right? It was about keeping people from being excited about Mrs. Clinton. So, I mean, when I, when I campaigned 
a year ago, I noticed this very strange phenomenon that I would knock on people's doors and they would say, well, I don't like Hillary Clinton, but I can't quite say why. You know, I just have this feeling that maybe she's corrupt or something. And, or sometimes it was more specific. I don't like Hillary Clinton because she's a mass murderer, right? And in both cases, there was, a, like, there was an internet effect there, right? Like, in case you're wondering, she's not actually a mass murderer, right? But, but people read over and over and over again, over and over and over again, that she was a mass murderer. Somewhere in between, the idea that Hillary Clinton was sick. This was very widespread. The idea that she had some disease and therefore she was unfit, right? And that idea was pitched right out of St. Petersburg. Um, that came right out of Russian advertising. They spread it and we believed it. Now it's our fault that we believed it. So, it, it, so the first part is, I mean, America is a half sovereign country. Hello, right? Like you in Europe, you have this like, you're, like you make this complaint, like we're not fully sovereign, you know? No, <laughs> joining the European Union does not make you not fully sovereign. Having another country decide who your president is, that's when you're not fully sovereign, right? We're not fully sovereign. It happens, it happened to us, it can happen to others, it happened to us. It's very, we've been very slow to recognize this because it's not a very pleasant thing to realize that another country can choose your president, but it just happened to us. And this is how, and it feel, by the way, it feels really strange, right? Um, the, in cyber war, there's this notion of cyber to physical, like that's the most frightening version of cyber war where you use cyber weapons, you use the digital world to change the physical world. So an example of cyber to physical is someone attacks your hydroelectric dams or someone attacks your electrical system and makes it go down. Mr. Trump is that. He is, an, he is a walking example of, of, of victory in cyber war where it's cyber to physical, and he is the physical thing. I mean, his, his presence in the White House, his rollicking, awful, destructive, chaotic, anarchic presence is the blow up, that's the bomb um, of the cyber war. And it feels terrible, by the way. Like, it's really, it's really no fun at all. So, okay, so that's one side of the answer. Um, Russia is, we, America was at the receiving end of history, okay? We, we got it. We, we, we were at the receiving end, and, and, that's, and it's, it's very important to be realistic about this, which isn't to say that like, Russia's all-powerful or like, they're terribly evil people or anything like that. It's to say they got to a certain place before we did, and that place is kleptocracy, media control by the state, and a, a form of authoritarianism where the idea is just to get everybody to do nothing to get everyone to be confused, uncertain about facts, um, believing that nothing can really be done, believing that everywhere else it's just the same, right? That's how Russia governs. And America was pushed in that direction because people didn't really vote for Trump because they thought he was gonna do anything. They voted for Trump on the idea, on the logic that the system is broken, therefore we can just do whatever, we can vote symbolically for this guy. Now, Okay, but the deeper point is, why was America vulnerable to this? We were vulnerable to this because we do have divisions. When, when Russia, when Russia so, so Russia invented a, an African-American activist group, right? They just invented it. It's called Blacktivist. They invented it. It doesn't exist in the real world. It only exists on the internet. And it is just there to make black-white tensions worse. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't work if there weren't such tensions, right? Um, they, so, and in general, we are vulnerable to this stuff because our own meat, we've let our own media collapse, especially local news, by the way, right? I'm going to say this in a country which still has local news, God bless you, but in, if you don't have local newspapers, then people just use the internet. And when they use the internet, they become much more vulnerable to conspiracy theories. Because what happens is that no one, there's no journalism anymore. Like they don't, you don't know the reporters personally. They're not talking about things you know about. And so people stop talking about journalism and instead they just say the media. And the media then becomes everything, right? And people don't distinguish between a good newspaper that's 500 miles away and total conspiracy theorizing that is invented in order to harm them. It's all just the media. So when you lose the local news, which we did, then you're inviting this kind of thing. You're inviting this kind of attack. And then finally, how did we invite this? Inequality, 
inequality. That's how we invited this. Because when, when you do what the United States did in the last 25 years, which is have an experiment to say, basically this is what we did to our own population. We said, let's see what happens when we let inequality levels go back to where they were in 1929, which is where they are right now. Levels of inequality in the US are identical to what they were in 1929. This is another reason why I can't stop thinking about the 1930s. Let's just run an experiment and see how much we've learned and how smart we are and whether our own population will react well when not the top 1%, but the top 0.001% controls more than half of the wealth. Let's see how well people react. And the answer is not that well. And that's not surprising because when you get to that position, people don't believe in social advancement anymore. And they shouldn't, unfortunately. If you were an American born in 1945, your chances of having a better standard of living than your parents were 80%. If you're an American born in 1984, your chances of having a better standard of living than your parents are 50%. And it just keeps going down. And subjectively, 60% um, of Americans now believe that their children will be worse off than they are. In that situation, people are less, if you don't believe in a future personally, if you don't see how things can go forward personally, it's harder to believe that government can do things. And then the propaganda comes in and says, yeah, this is just the way the world is. It's, it, government can't do anything for you. It's all about the Mexicans. It's all about the outsiders. You're more vulnerable to that. So, I mean, Russia did something. They did something very impressive. They did something very clever. They chose our presidential, they chose our president, right? I mean, as one of their parliamentary deputies just the other day said, I mean, openly on television, um, Right, you know, he said, Americans, America's spies slept while we chose their president, which is, I mean, basically right. So, um, yeah, right, but yeah, it's not any fun. I, I assure you, it's really not fun to be in this situation. But, you know, and so of course, like, we should have fewer aircraft carriers and we should have better cyber defense. We should spend less time on the internet. But the fundamental lesson is, we shouldn't have let our country get to a point where we were going to be vulnerable to this kind of thing. Like, that's the fundamental lesson of responsibility for, for us. Mm. And then there we're talking about economical uh, inequality, not letting that happen. We're talking about education, I think, as well. Um, so I'll go. I'll go ahead because I just. Oh, I, actually, the kleptocracy instead of democracy. Uh, could you? Talk a bit more about that, because um, this is what you say. This is a word I don't think everyone knows exactly what you mean when you say it. Okay. So one, one of the literary conceits in On Tyranny is that I'm using classical vocabulary. The word tyranny itself is, that's obviously a, a, a Greek word, an ancient Greek word. And I'm using these words because the American founding fathers used them in their debates about the Constitution, they talked about tyranny, and, and they try, and that the idea of the Constitution was to set up institutions which would make tyranny less likely. And their assumption, which I think was very reasonable, was that there would be aspiring, Amer there would be aspiring American tyrants in the future, and therefore you have to build institutions that will make that less likely. Um, and so then there are other, so then I, once I got into the habit of using these ancient references, I kept going. So oligarchy is a really important one. Oligarchy in Thucydides meant rule by a few. And then in Aristotle, it meant rule by a wealthy few. And then interestingly, that word oligarchy resurfaces in Russia in the 1990s, both oligarchy and oligarchs. And then very interestingly, that word oligarchy and oligarchs comes into American English in 2000 or so, which reflects real historical developments. The reason why in the 90s people in Russia and Ukraine too still talk about oligarchs is because the, the country was being ruled by a few oligarchical clans, basically. And the reason it came, in, came into the US was that enough Americans looked at the word in Russia and said, hmm, <laughs> this is not so, terribly different from our situation, especially, by the way, after 2010, when, which was a, a, a terrible moment in American political life, where our Supreme Court decided that 
you, anyone could contribute any amount of money to basically any campaign. I mean, that's really changed our political life because it means that if you're a billionaire, you can basically buy an election, at least on the scale on the scale of a state, which has been horrible. It's been fatal. Um, so then, kleptocracy means kleptocracy means rule by thieves, um, and usually rule by rich thieves. And so the distinction I make between oligarchy and kleptocracy is oligarchy is when you have several rich groups and kleptocracy is when one of those rich groups takes over the state. So Ukraine today is more like an oligarchy and Russia is more like a kleptocracy. That is one oligarchical group is the same group that controls the state, right? That's a, that's a kleptocracy. So these are old words, but they, they're, they're, they're useful, right? I mean, in America, we talk about democracy all the time. Like, as far as we're concerned, there's democracy and then there's everything else. And it sometimes helps to have other concepts, even if, they don't, even if they're not perfectly accurate, because they can help you to see what's, what's actually happening and what's actually coming. Because the point about the oligarchy is that it can work, right? I mean, Russian standards of living are going down and they're not gonna go up anytime soon, but that doesn't mean the system is gonna change anytime soon, necessarily. Um, American standards of living, if you're not if you're not in the top, have basically been flat since 1985. For the vast majority of the population, the standard of living has not improved now for for a couple of generations. It's not it's not a pretty picture. That doesn't mean that the system has to change. It can mean you can slip to a system where a few rich people control the state, and the way that they win elections is partly by faking them. In Russia, they're very much fake, partly by faking them and partly by convincing people that the state really can't do anything to improve your standard of living. And it's striking how in America we're moving in that direction. So, you know, we, we, this guy was elected. I mean, what's, one of the things that's funny about Mr. Trump is that as far as I can tell, he doesn't actually have any money, but he was, he was elected. Now he wants to be an oligarch, right? Like that, if, that's like one of the many sad things, like his aspiration is to be a Russian oligarch. That's his aspiration. Um, he doesn't want to be president of the United States, right? He wants to be a Russian oligarch. That's what's kind of sad about the whole thing because it means that he looks up to other Russian oligarchs. He's like, oh, I want to be your client. You know, please, please, will you meet with me? You know, and he's, meanwhile, he's president of the United States. That's what's kind of sad for us. But, but the point is, his, he couldn't, even though I don't think he really has any money, he only could be elected in an oligarchical situation. Because what he said when he campaigned was, he said, look, we all know, he didn't use the word oligarchy, okay, but I'm going to. He said, look, we all know it's an oligarchy, but I'm your oligarch. If you vote for the other person, she's gonna have invisible oligarchs behind her and you don't know who they are. But look, I'm me, I'll be your oligarch, okay? And that worked, but it could only work in a situation where a lot of Americans already thought that we were in a situation where you know the state was already controlled by the wealthy. You see, you see, so you get into that situation where everybody thinks it's an oligarchy, and then you, and then people can run as the good oligarch. And now, of course, the Democrats are tempted by this, and the Democrats are now thinking some of them this isn't going to happen, you know, God willing. But but they're thinking, oh yeah, we have to find our oligarch to run up against that oligarch. Our time is. Um... We have, we have another 10 minutes, and I thought I want to talk a bit about Europe. You have uh, claimed that we live in an uh, illusion of uh, the idea of the national states, that that's actually just a European illusion. And then you also have these thoughts about the inevitability of um, history and the, the what drives us forward is actually an illusion and a dangerous illusion as well. I heard you talk uh, in front of a, a lot of students somewhere in Europe It's um, where you discuss this and warn the students of believing in these illusions. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. No, no national states? No. It's a nice question because it leads us back to what history is and why understanding history can be a good thing, especially in difficult moments. It, it may be that in normal times, it's all right to get history wrong, but that in difficult times like the present, you can't really afford to have 
the same illusions that you might be able to have at other times. The illusion that I talk about, or one of the illusions I talk about at the end of On Tyranny, and it's, it's also where I begin the next book, is called The Politics of Inevitability. It has, it has an American version, it has a European version. I'm gonna start with the American version because it's sometimes easier to recognize a bad thing. We're all human, right? It's easier to recognize a bad thing when it's somebody else's bad thing. So I'll start with us. Our version of the politics of inevitability says um, something like this. Nature leads to uh, technology, technology leads to markets, markets leads, lead to democracy, therefore we know the laws of history, um, no one really has any responsibility, everything's gonna be fine. I hope that sounds kind of ridiculous, because it is, but that's, that's what the politics of inevitability is like. So there, there used to be a communist version, the communist version went like, there was nature, therefore there's technology, therefore there's social conflict, therefore there's revolution, therefore um, there, will be, there will be equality in the future, right? It's also a kind of story of inevitability. The, the European version, the contemporary one, and this is gonna be harder because it's really close, right? It's close, but bear with me. The European version goes like this. It says, we, the nation is very old, the nation has had some experience. The nation has learned from that experience. And what it's learned is that it should be part of Europe. Um, this, is, this is what I call the fable of the wise nation. And the, the specific form that it takes in most of Europe is, Sweden's a little bit different, I grant you. But in most of Europe, it takes the form, um, we had a second world war, and then we recognized that war was a bad thing. This is what the, our wise nations recognized that war was a bad thing, and so therefore we, beat, we, 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 we built European integration, and now we have peace. Now, this is a story which is, it's an anti-American story, because the idea is that those silly Americans didn't learn from the Second World War that war was a bad thing, and they, they, they just keep fighting wars, those silly Americans. But we learned that war was a bad thing, and hence European integration, okay? Now, the only problem with that story is that it's completely wrong. It's complete, Europeans did not learn from the Second World War that war was a bad thing. And that's not why you have European integration. And most of you never had nation states who could have learned those things. That story is completely and utterly wrong at, like every, at every possible level. So let me start with the, with the not learning. If anyone was gonna learn that war was a bad thing from the Second World War, it would have been the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, and the Jews. And you say what you want about contemporary Israel, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, but you can't really say that those are the most pacific countries in the world, right? So if people really did learn from suffering, which unfortunately they don't, at least not automatically, you would expect that Eastern Europe and Israel would be zones of peace. That's not how it worked out, right? Um, so what did Europeans actually learn? The West Europeans who started the Second World, who started uh, who started the European Integration Project, they didn't learn from the Second World War as such. They learned from something which is subtly different, but importantly different. They learned that they were losing colonial wars, okay? Now, to see this, you have to recognize what the Second World War was. The Second World War was fundamentally, at its core, a German colonial war for Ukraine. The Second World War was about Germany taking over East European territory and treating those peoples as colonial peoples and exploiting that land. That, the Second World War was the, last, it was the last throw of European colonialism. The reason that we don't see it as such is because we don't think, that Euro we don't think of Europeans treating other Europeans that way, but they, but they do but they do, and that's what it was about. We also don't see it that way because we don't think about Eastern Europe enough when we think about the Second World War. But from the German point of view, the Nazi point of view, that was a colonial war, and it was a lost colonial war. This is not unique, okay? What, what it is, is the first major defeat in a colonial war, which is then followed by others. So the, Ger the Germans, the Federal Republic of Germany, is keen to have Europe after the Second World War because the Germans are the first ones to understand that empire in the traditional sense or in any sense is not going to be possible, right? Because they don't have a maritime empire and they've just lost 
in the most convincing possible fashion their attempt at a European empire. So naturally, they're in favor of this Europe. Who else is in favor of this Europe? Well, the Belgians, the Dutch, um, the, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, later on, even the British. Why? Because they learned things from the Second World War in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? No, because they lost colonial wars. When you lose colonial wars, when you lose empire, Europe is where you go. Europe is the safe landing. And when you do it, rather than telling yourself, I just lost some embarrassing and bloody colonial wars which involved a lot of torture and destruction on my side. Rather than doing that, you say, we are a wise nation which learned from the Second World War that war is a bad thing and hence European integration. Okay, so that whole thing was a cover story. And it was a cover story which entered into your textbooks. And now most Europeans actually think that there was some kind of nation state and the nation state learned from the war, okay? Which is like, I'd be willing to humor that in some other time and place, but right now, the problem with it is that it opens the door for populism or nationalism or fascism or whatever you want to call it. Whatever view it is that says, let's go, again, going back to the 1930s, let's go back to the 1930s because then we had a nation state and there weren't all these foreigners around, which is what ex implicitly or explicitly fascists and populists in, you know, from Scandinavia to Southern Europe, they're all saying that, right? And the reason it doesn't make any sense is that I, I realize that like you, there, you can pick out exceptions, like Finland is a pretty good one. But in general, these European countries that built, this, that built European integration, they were never nation states. It just never happened. I know it takes a few seconds to sink in because it's like against everything you're ever taught, but it never happened. That's the fable of the wise nation. It's a fable, it never happened. Britain was never a nation state. Britain was an empire, then its empire fell apart, and as its empire fell apart, it joined European integration. France was not a nation state. Algeria was an integral part of France, right? When the Front National looks back at the 1930s and says, that was a time when France belonged to the Frenchmen, no. Algeria was a province of France. France had a huge empire in Southeast Asia, right? There was no time when France belonged. When people say France for the French, there was no moment. It never happened. So when, when Brexit or, you know, or, or Le Pen, you know, when, Farah, when Farage or Le Pen say, um, Let's, we're going to go back to this time, that time never happened. It never existed. So what the European Union did, the European Union was not a choice that the wise nation made, having learned from the Second World War. The European Union was basically your last chance to be states. It's not that the European Union takes your sovereignty away. Your states grew up with European integration. If your states leave the European Union, there is no certainty that they will continue to exist. And I think it's unlikely they will continue to exist in the form to which you are accustomed. Let me, let me put it that way. I'm happy to put it in a more dramatic way, right? Like, for example, if Britain really does leave the European Union, which, by the way, I don't think that it will do, because in my, I, there are things that for me are just too stupid to happen. But if Britain does leave the, that's a meta-historical view, I, I, you know. But if, if Britain does leave the European Union, but there's no such thing as Brexit, because if there's exit, there won't be Britain. If there's Britain, there won't be exit. And if there's exit, there won't be Britain. Because Scotland's gonna go, Northern Ireland will probably also go, and you're gonna end up with a far right England, which nobody cares about anymore, right? I and mean, that's a nice way of putting it, frankly. So, so, but the fund, but, but Britain's just an example. You, your states were rescued by the European Union, not, not the other way, which isn't to say the European Union is perfect or couldn't be changed. It, I agree that it has to be changed. It has to be enlivened. Young people have to become interested in it for some reason. But the point is that if you say, let's go back to the nation state, what you're really doing is going forward into a complete unknown because <laughs> the Europe of nation states never was. Timothy? It's fantastic listening to you. It's uh, worked so many thoughts. We didn't get to the point to what should we do about it, but a part of that uh, is actually in this book. Yeah. So um, a big hand for Timothy Snyder. Thank you yes. for it.